Definitely see it in a theater, but you don't have to see it right away. It is still, so far in 2024, the, my favorite movie to look at. Welcome back to the break room. And you know, it's the great room around here. Oh yeah, this is our destiny. You two, me, but the question is, do you have it in you to make it epic? Get out. <laughs> the fact that you've got a set on you doing that in front of me, that was brave. That's probably the bravest thing you've ever done. I know. Should I take it back? Should I not do it? I know, it's amazing. All right, it's our break room movie review for Furiosa. Hit the movie review graphic. We have to do this entire review with an Australian accent. <laughs> no! Ladies nice. and gentlemen, start your engines! <laughs> yeah, okay, I regret that. <laughs> hey, we just getting started, Ma! Started! <laughs> More? Started! See, it only occurred started. to me... <laughs> it only occurred to me that I was doing an impression of Chris Hemsworth. But then now I'm like, oh no. What do you think? What do yeah. you think the whole movie is about? That's right. Where do you think it's set? It's in Australia. How, what accent were they using? Australia? The, Wastelandian? Were the actors actually Australian? All of them were Australian. What's the director? Is he? Yeah. Oh, Australian. Yeah. There you go. Hey, welcome. There's an Australian count. How many did I hit? How At many least. do you think I'll do this whole uh, review? Leave your comments below and see if you're close. Uh, I'm Evan, the producer of The Break Room, and joining me today to discuss Furiosa, a Mad Max saga are Eric Voss. Here I am. That's the show I'm on. <laughs> And Maud Garrett. Woo! Otherwise known for this review as Ma Mad Garrett. What? Mad oh, Maud. Oh, Mad, Mad Maud. Maud. Yeah. Uh, before we get into the rules of our movie reviews, a quick non-spoiler summary of the film. Furiosa tells the story of the character originally played by Charlize Theron in Mad Max Fury Road. From her childhood and beyond, we follow the character on her journey entangled with Chris Hemsworth's villainous Dementis as we find out how she ended up driving the war rig all those years down the line. And before we get into uh, the rest of the video, credit where credit is due, we're going to guess the final movie rating that we're gonna give it. You know we rate the movie here. Uh, it's an idea that Eric suggested we do last time and it was pretty fun when we got the review. Oh, so Eric, okay. thanks for suggesting this. We're gonna do it again. We rate, we rate the movie one to five in different parts to get a total score of 100. Uh, we normally have four people here. Zach and I saw it together at IMAX. It was great. Thank you to our friends at IMAX for letting us see the movie early. I have Zach's scores written down on this big piece of paper. He decided to write on a full sheet of paper. That's because he has pens in his hands at all times. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah you got it. You, know you mean they these pens? They're just getting bigger and bigger. These pens? These are not pen sized. They're something else sized, and I don't feel comfortable holding them. Well, you're not <laughs> Zach. That's why. There's a there's not a full back to this shelf here, <laughs> and I don't know where they were. All right, so I'll give you all some posted notes. We haven't talked too much of the movie about the movie off screen, so I'm curious what everyone thinks will the final score will be. All right, prediction locked. All right, great. Nobody share it. Okay, so before we get into the whole rating of the movie. Uh, let's just do some quick uh, kind of uh, non-spoiler general reactions. What did everyone think uh, of Furiosa? Should people be seeing this in theaters opening weekend, Memorial Day weekend in America? I think uh, see it, just definitely see it in a theater, but you don't have to see it right away. Make sure you have like a free afternoon. Don't see it late at night. Just go find a time where you have like after you've eaten a meal or before you've eaten it, just like a decent time during the day. It'll take you, it's like two hour, 20 minutes it's long. long. Movie. It's a long it's film. A long and I will say it feels it, but it is still so far in 2024, the, my favorite movie to look at. It has been so, it's such a gorgeously shot film. It's stunning. It's like, it has some of the, like I think the sequence, they call it the stairway to heaven or the, the war rig sequence in the film without spoiling anything. It's just such an incredible sequence. Dune part, chapter two, Dune part two, I think it's still my favorite movie of this year so far. Mm -hmm. But this was just like the coolest movie to look at. I I agree. Eat a meal before you go into this one. Don't do it late at night because I think that that would dra drag on a little bit. Um, I think you'd be doing a disservice if you were not watching this on a big screen. You saw it on IMAX. I saw it on Screen X, and Screen X is where like they put oh, they cool. project down the, the sides. And yeah. I th and I feel like for a wasteland, 
that was a really cool way to expand just mm. how big these deserts and scenes are. So it did enhance the experience for me. Um, but I think using the sound and the visuals on a bigger screen is how you're supposed to watch this movie. See, I saw it in a Dolby, so the sound mix was really incredible. I found as I've like seen more and more movies, I think I prefer the Dolby to IMAX, uh, just because like, um, man, a poorly mixed acoustic experience yeah. in a movie yeah. theater yeah. can yeah. really just take you out of a movie. Whereas as long as the visual is still mostly intact, I'm okay. I think I like the Screen X better than the IMAX, only because Whoa. the IMAX is such a big screen that sometimes to watch it, you have to capture it all. I kind of like that surrounding feel. It was the smallest cinema, mm -hmm. but they've done a really kind of great way to utilize the space. Yeah, Screen X is interesting too because those side screens aren't on for the whole movie, no. right? And I don't notice. It doesn't take me out of it. Interesting. Like, sometimes it'll be on, sometimes it won't, and it just doesn't register. It's a really seamless way to watch cool. it, I think. Mm, Not an ad, okay, okay. but thank you for inviting me for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found, um, yeah, seeing the movie, this is like, we've said it a lot here in the break room, especially this year, like, see movies on the big screen, you know, see them loud and like you know, get the full experience. And this one for sure is great. Like ex exactly what you're saying to, to lose yourself in the visuals, um, as well as just like, you know, I, I remember talking to a lot of people about Fury Road and people were like, yeah, I just watched it on my laptop. I'm like, that's, <gasps> you can't watch Blasphemous. Fury Road on your laptop. And you definitely shouldn't do that with this movie as well. That's I, a Fury alleyway. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you got the full road for that. But yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed this movie. I'm looking forward to seeing it a second time and looking forward to talking to you both about it. Sure. Uh, so as we do here on The Break Room Movie Review, this is your spoiler warning. So after this, oh. we're gonna spoil the movie. Uh, you know, come back and watch it or stay. And uh, you know, leave a little comment about your favorite road to drive on. <laughs> um, as we do, we here on The Break Room Movie Review, we rate the movie in parts with each part getting graded between one to five. Half points are, are okay, and our off-screen team will be doing the math to get us to sum at the end. We'll be grading the script, the story and writing, yep. the acting, the directing, the visuals, and of course, the most important category, the sound and score. Uh, so let's start with the script written by director George Miller uh, and Nico Lathoris, who co-wrote Fury Road, also an accomplished Australian director and actor. Uh, what do you guys think? The script, the story for uh, Furiosa. So for me, this category will probably get the lowest score um, just because I think the script doesn't have the efficiency that the Fury Road script. And if you go look at the script, it's mostly storyboard. They had storyboarded that movie out for almost decades. Yeah, I think, that's true. Yeah, they took so much time to get that story down to just the essential. It was almost like reading a graphic novel when you read that screenplay. This felt like it was just like, they did spend a long time working on this movie, but I think structurally, there were some choices that I think were just a little indulgent with uh, with how much time we spend with Dementis. I think the movie, we just take a bit too long mm -hmm. to get Anya Taylor-Joy's era of Furiosa into the film. She comes at kind of the halfway mark, and I think she needs to come in into like the one third mark. So I give it a three out of five, mm -hmm. um, but I think the world building is still just as great. Really, I just feel like yeah. it's an extension to Fury Road, so it just kind of builds on it. Mm -hmm. um, I think like the characterization, I think the the journey that um, Furiosa goes on with Jack, I think uh, was very interesting to me. Uh, and I just think like the politics um, between Gastown, the Bullet Farm, and the Citadel was just very fun to explore those themes. But yeah, I thought it was just interesting to see how uh, elusive actual power is in a dystopia. Uh, and I like that we explored more of like what it means to be a history man slash a word burger and how this uh, culture mythologizes characters mm. and the importance of, of, uh, of legend yeah. more than actual resources to survive, that the story is more important than life. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, but I, I give it a three out of five ultimately because I yeah. think script structure, they, they needed to restructure stuff in the first act. Yeah. Pacing in this movie was tough. This movie felt like it went way too long. I remember it, it will break it up into part one, part two, part three, part four. The, the last two parts when it cleared the black and then did that, I was like, it's still going. <laughs> I feel like they could have condensed it completely. I yeah. also feel like, I mean, there's a couple of issues with it. I'm going to give it like a two and a half, and I'll tell you why. We are building out this world, which is supposed to be in Australia, right? Mm -hmm. It is not a fun place. Yeah. You do not want to be here. You have pustules and boils. People are so deformed. You know, it's ugly. It's awful. And what made Fury Road work was that our protagonist was trying to rescue people from it. Mm -hmm. They were trying to, and that as a directive, 
you're vouching for them. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to save them from what's disgusting. We lose that in this film completely. You are not rooting for anyone in this film. Everyone's bad. It's like, a, who's the, the worst person? And I feel like Furiosa then loses herself in that also. Mm -hmm. So I stopped rooting for everyone in this film. And I think when you project such disparagement, just, you know, such awful brutality all the time, I didn't want to be there. Sure. You know what I mean? So it's just like, and I think that... Mad Max is doing what Borderlands is doing. I just think Borderlands is Borderlands is doing I and mean, Borderlands is a video game. We're going to get the movie soon. Borderlands I think is going to do Mad Max better than Mad Max because they're injecting it with humor. You think the mo the Borderlands movie is going to be better than I think that the Right, she said it here. Remember I think it. tonally, I think tonally they're doing better because if it's such a wasteland and you don't want to be there, the redeeming factor becomes humor. Mm. And we don't really have that in this movie. I feel like Dementia is kind of funny. Well, I think Dementis is uh, in a movie that no one else is in. Mm, I feel like tonally, you had a, you had like really big characters, like the two brothers were quite over mm -hmm. the top. One of them was delivering dialogue in a really big way, but then when Jack has his moment of dialogue, he's, I know I'll go into this with acting, but like he delivers a deadpan and like they're in a different movie. I think script wise, they put way too much on Anya to be able to say things without saying them. And there were many times where it's like it would have done better if it was just said. Mm. I think motive, I think um, what's going on needed a little bit more in the script mm. instead of like cut to this moment because they're relying on chemistry that didn't happen. They're relying sure. on so much and they're also relying on big bad explosions yeah. to tell the story. So the action is the plot because I think that the plot was lacking and that's because of the script. I think it's okay to have a restraint in dialogue. You know, uh, Denis Villeneuve recently said like dialogue is like his least favorite part of filmmaking. Yeah. And I think it's okay. But that's why I'm like, if you did storyboard this movie in your script, you still indulge too much in just another shot of Chris Hemsworth's amazing horde of biker gangs that all yeah. look really cool. We saw like probably 12 different shots of just them yeah. pulling up somewhere. Yes. And it's like, that's kind of a directing choice, but it's more of like a script choice just because I know how he structures his screenplays as storyboards and I yeah I, I agree with you I think it um, I'm okay with their strain and dialogue it just uh, it doesn't have the narrative thrust that Fury Road had and that made it so great and and Dementis is like kind of a mix of like he uh, Heath Ledger's Joker and Captain Hook I would say yeah, it felt wow. more <laughs> caricature rather yeah. than character and I have a, a, a problem with this and there's another movie that I brought up which was the live action Beauty and the Beast if you're gonna go camp everyone needs to be camp Sure. Because what happened in that one was Emma Watson played it real straight. And when you're doing that next to um, Josh Gad mm -hmm. and um, oh, I can't remember his name, Gaston, mm -hmm. uh, who went full camp, it the tonal consistency, like it needs to be on the same page. And I don't think it was with this one. Anya Taylor-Joy was very straight, was very suppressed yeah. with her emotions. What's his name? Luke, Luke Evans. Evans. Luke Evans. Fantastic. Knocked it out of the park. But what weighed it down was that they were tonally very different uh, with, with the characters. So for Chris to go that far and then for Anya to bring it back down and then for other characters to kind of bring it back down where other big over the top things were happening. If you're going to have a guy suspended with a double strung guitar with flames coming out, everyone needs to match that level and I just think that Anya what did she we were joking she had 30 lines of dialogue mm -hmm. I think she needed more I think she needed to have these moments where we the uh, the the audience could connect with her and I think that lack of disconnect that I had with her and everyone else was like it kind of actually dulled the rest of the sensory um, explosions that happened because I stopped caring yeah I wonder if like any of that is do you feel like that's affected by the fact that you know where Furiosa ends up, like that she isn't going to see like the green place eventually. You no, know, I think like... it was the lack of plot. I honestly do. Like what happens in this movie? What, how would you elevate a pitch this movie? Yeah, it's, you know, a girl trying to get back home. That's, that's she what it is. But she doesn't. But yeah, she doesn't. Yeah. Like at least Fury Road, I mean, the plot was so basic. They drove, they turned around, they drove back. Yeah. But at least it was a set plot that you knew mm -hmm. what was happening because there was trying to be like a rescue mission. For this one, she's like a plant sort of thing that's trying to bring down this structure from the inside. But who is her real enemy? Is it when she's at one structure or is it when she's like, or is it Dementis? Like I feel yeah. like that gets lost. And by the time she kind of ends it all with him, I was like, thank God. But like that took far too long. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's like, part of it too. I think it's it's her character that is against this world, right? It's like it's how you find yourself in in the world that is presented to you, right? Especially like when you see the stark contrast of like leaving the green place 
and now being thrust into the wasteland. It's like, who do you become and like, what do you hold on to throughout that, right? And then everybody else around her has chosen different paths of lives, yeah. right? Life and like what they're doing to uh, survive and what they're doing to exist. And I did like the end where Dementors is kind of explaining, we're actually on the same path, I'm just further along. But like, yeah. I am the end of your destiny. Like I kind of understood that moment, but I think when you lack all the previous beats leading up to it, it didn't land as hard for me. If you did enjoy this movie, I am I love that you did. I was really confused at the end of this movie where I was like, I just didn't love it. Like I really mm -hmm. was not enjoying this experience. And friends that I took, oh, a friend that I went, who's also Australian, so maybe that's the common denominator, I'm not sure. I wanted to love it even more. But we were both like, yeah, that was just, that just didn't do what it was set out to do. And I actually appreciated Fury Road more. And I'm hearing that a lot, that this movie makes Fury Road better. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And, and because uh, when we went to see it, George Miller introduced the film, which was really cool to see him in person. He was saying that, you know, there's tons of stories about the production on Mad Max Fury Road. There's tons about like the behind the scenes and stuff like that. Yeah, Tom but, Hardy was late and Charlie Theron was like, stop being such a diva and let's <laughs> film a movie. But um, he was saying that, you know, when they were putting Fury Road together, he was like, well, I wanted them to understand like who Furiosa was. And so I had this ready for them to read right. like a script or, or some version of this that they could read to understand this character and how she ends up and so I didn't get a chance to watch Fury Road before watching Furiosa so I've been doing a weird kind of like backwards watch where I've gone to like Furiosa, Fury Road, Mad Max Road Warrior. It's really interesting how seeing what he's done with the world over time but mm -hmm. also like how he's giving more meaning to Furiosa's character, it feels more tragic. And I think you could do a very interesting double feature of going straight from Furiosa right into Fury Road, even though it would be um, your whole day. Yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. I think it does give uh, that character more depth for sure. But also like a movie should be able to stand on its own. And I do agree that I, I felt like there was definitely some pacing problems in the beginning. I think we talked about the film yesterday, Eric, and we were, I, we were saying like, what happens in the middle again? Yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. You know, um, and I think, you know, Warner Brothers definitely has a problem with marketing George Miller's films where they're like, well, he's like the Fury Road guy. We got to show all the action scenes, which means like, there was so much Anya Taylor-Joy in the trailers and she shows up exactly at like, the midway point or just before the midway point. I don't think I was ready to spend as much time with like the younger, younger Furiosa, but I think that actress did a great job. Yeah. Uh, Lila Brown. Um, and I'm really curious to see what a, a, a tighter version of the movie looks like, but I also did ultimately, like the more I've kind of like sat with the movie and thought about like her journey and kind of like finding, you know, choosing what to hold on to as she, she tries to get back to the green place. I've come to like appreciate the film a lot. I like that. Um, I like that for you. Yeah. So okay. I'm I'm gonna give uh, I'm gonna give the writing uh, a four. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, I think it could have been like a certain tighter, but I I definitely it, I think I'm maybe reacting to a little bit more of like kind of the subtext that I'm I'm gleaning from it. So sure. yeah. Uh, Zach gave the writing a three point five. Um, okay. I think he agrees with uh, most of what you guys were saying, um, and I think specifically I'm trying to parse through the little notes he gave me. Uh, he said. Uh, it didn't offer enough surprises or advancements from what Fury Road established. And I do yeah. think that is correct, yeah. right? Because you do know where this character ends up. You know that she's not going to kind of have this big payoff all the way at the end of the, that movie. So what is her payoff here? And it's going to be up to you as the viewer, I think, if you felt like her interaction with Dementis, uh, the final scene, uh, well, was enough. Yeah. You know, I've also seen other non-spoiler reviews where they were like, this is the like origin stories are it. Like this is such a great example of how origin stories really work. And they like amplify the property completely. I do think it's fascinating that there is a wide spectrum of enjoying mm -hmm. this movie to not enjoying this movie. Mm -hmm. But I think the Rotten Tomatoes score at the moment is like pretty, pretty high. Yeah. Critics and audience. Yeah. I think yeah, it's so maybe I'm the problem. 80s. And if that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I thought Dune 2 was a perfect movie. Agreed. This one? I, I don't want to watch it again. <laughs> I'd watch it again. No. Yeah. I would, yeah. I, I, I actually, uh, yeah, I'm seeing it again this weekend, I think. Yeah. Um, all right, so great in the acting. Uh, Anya Taylor Joy, of course, is Furiosa. Chris Hemsworth as Dementis. And uh, Alila Brown as a, a younger Furiosa. We've got, you know, a ton of other characters and actors uh, along the way. We have some people who appeared in Fury Road, kind of reprising some of the roles or characters being played by other actors. Mm -hmm. What do you guys feel? Uh, we, we've already touched on it. Yeah. What do you guys feel? Yeah, I do feel like there's inconsistency with how camp they're going with it. Um, 
I do think Anya Taylor Joy is a fantastic actress. She does bring a lot with saying nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I just was there was a point where the uh, war truck driver, um, where he kind of Jack. pulls over Jack, which is mm -hmm. my brother's name. You'd think I'd love this, right? <laughs> and he walks back, and she's got the gun to him, and he's like, "I've lost my crew. I have to rebuild. Can we just?" Do and I was like, "Is he not trying?" It took me so out of the movie mm. in that moment where I was like, how did that make the edit? Hmm. I thought it was so badly done. Hmm. Oh, interesting. I disagree. I yeah. can't fault the acting in this movie because, yes, it is inconsistent, but I think that was each of the actors is doing their job to play the character as an archetype, as, mm -hmm. a, as an archetype in legend. Like, this is the story of the Iliad, and I think, or I don't know, you can point to a lot of different um, Greek mythological stories, mm -hmm. um, and I think there are characters who transform. If you are Anya Taylor-Joy, if you're Furioso, you see as someone who's, um, her whole objective is to protect the comforts of home, the abundance of the green place, and to find a way back to it. And eventually she has to sever that arm that is her roadmap back yeah, to it yeah. and transform herself in order to survive in this wasteland. And I like that journey for the character. And while she is not as over the top as Dementis is, I think that is a, that is a calculated choice by the actor to be a dip, to resist the temptations of this hellscape uh, and to not allow herself to completely lose her mind. And I think every actor in their own right did their job um, in terms of like what was demanded of them from the story. And that includes Jack. I think Jack uh, is kind of like what Furiosa aspires to be as an imperator, as a driver who is not shaken. And I think yeah, in that yeah. moment, his only uh, objective is to reassemble his Argonauts in a new envoy. And mm -hmm. that's that's all he cares about in that moment. And but there he, was no passion or drive behind it at all. There was such a disconnect and I felt like that really impaired well, the I don't think he wanted them. to. I don't think he wanted to give her any signals of romance in that moment. He's like, he really just views her as a member of the crew. And I think he only but reports to that professional have, respect. But then they do have feelings and it's like they had one moment to kind of show that and that was stitching up the shoulder and again it's like it, there was nothing tangible there I don't yeah think. I mean I definitely would have wanted to see a little bit more of like a training montage or, or some like tutelage thing between the two of them how they connect she finally like this Jack should represent hope to her she, like because like yeah but I, I he think... accepts her he's like treating her as an equal like this should be such a pivotal moment and he's the beacon of light and hope but i don't think I, I don't so th i think he is a means to an end for her yeah yeah he's a ferryman he's the um you know karen across the river of sticks for her but like, she's had to hide her entire life and he sees her that's a moment but that I, should have been explored but also I like i don't know if she can be like but you get me, right? You you get what I'm going through in the sense of like I've I used to live in paradise, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't know what your background is, I don't know what you're going for, but you have a path of life that clearly works and clearly can be something I can do that can get me back on, you know, the track. Right. Yeah. The, well, the fact that we're not having the same sort of thought through this. Thing. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think what you're getting at, Maud, is there was a problem with characterization in the script for these characters. I think if there if there are different interpretations, if we're not clear where these character beats are, I think that's more of a problem with the script, which Got is it. why I'm okay giving it a three out of five. Yep. But for acting, the fact that these actors had to convey so much yeah. with so little dialogue on the page for them, I think they all gave a lion's effort, and yeah. I, I give them a five out of five. I think this okay. cast was incredible. Yeah, I really liked Chris Hemsworth. I think just kind of on the issues of like tone of camp and everything. I think this world likes to be that way. And I, I think even seeing like Max as kind of like a stoic kind of guy who just like has like these like one liners, like even in Road Warrior, he's like, hey, you, you, you come to me. If you got a problem, come to me. And it's like very interesting, but it's not as like big as everyone else is playing it. And then and Fury, same thing with Fury Road, where it's mm -hmm. truly like, you know, the Citadel is like, Wild, right? Like yeah. mo mother's milk and everything, and uh, the. But it's gonna be a lovely day. Like Love they're it. operating. In yeah, a yeah, yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then, but he's still like pretty quiet in it. And then even Furiosa is like pretty. I, I was surprised. I I remembered her performance very differently when I watched the uh, Charlize Theron when I watched mm -hmm. the film. So seeing kind of like these actors and like really liked Anya Taylor Joy, and I really uh, I really kind of dug the whole uh, ensemble. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's gonna be a five for me as well. Nice. Yeah. No, Brian, four point five. 
Why did I dock a point five? You You'll never point? know. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I think there. I think maybe I just wanted more scenes with Aunt Taylor Joy, just to see a little bit more of the 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 the, the range. But we do see kind of her go from zero to sixty very very fast, and uh, and I think it, it it really works. But yeah, I'm giving it a three point five. Um, you know, I really do want to champion Australian actors. Uh, I definitely don't want to shit on these people. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um, I love hearing the Australian accent throughout this entire film. I loved that there was, um, I mean, this is a script thing as well, but they were using lexicon from mm. Aussies and that was a lot of fun. You might need subtitles for some of them. Um, but so it was a 3.5 for me, but you're right. I think that's tied so much to the script. They were doing the best that they can with what they had. Um, but that is my, that's my final one. Oh cool. man, the hate in the comments. Oh no, no. I think I'm a lot of people are going to feel the way you feel, Mud. Okay. Yeah. yeah and if you didn't, no one's wrong. It's fine. If you <laughs> loved it, I'm so glad you loved it. I love that you love this. I wanted to love it. I want to love this. Yeah. It's un-Australian of me to not love this. <laughs> I'm literally probably not allowed back in my country after this. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, hey, Zach gave it a four. Yay. Moving on. <laughs> All right, so uh, grading the directing. Of course, George Miller approaching 80, looking pretty spry when I saw him the other day at IMAX. Um, yeah, yeah, 79. Yeah, 79, yeah, 79. 79, 79. He's, yeah. he's, he's, he's getting up there, but he's still making like these, these really interesting films. Mm -hmm. I think something that I've kind of appreciated by looking at his whole filmography is that he's always done like what he is like kind of interested in, it, what, mm -hmm. what he's drawn to at that time. Like in between Fury Road and this, he made a movie about, you know, genies or, or gin rather 3,000 years of longing 3,000 years of longing which was like cut like a Mad Max movie this I'm saying like you know this is the Warner Brothers like marketing issues with him and it's not that type of movie at all it's a very quiet mm. it's a movie it's a uh, it's a fable it's Idris Elba playing a gin trying to trick Tilda Swinton into freeing him mm. uh, it's very romantic and it's it's very quiet and it's it's so interesting to go from this mm. to or from that to now Furiosa and yeah, I mean, Zach and I were saying that like uh, when we got out, you know, we're eating eating our little sliders, and we're like, man, this is a world you kind of want to lose yourself in for two hours, even as gross as it is, as like dry and 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 disgusting. It's like you want to see what's happening because there's so many things that are just unexplained, but also in a way that like gets your brain ticking. Um, Anyways, I that's how I feel about it. So I, I'm I'm pretty high on 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 the general kind of approach to this. But how do y'all feel? Um, I feel that the the director's primary responsibility is to tell the best story possible visually. And uh, like if you're just trying to transport someone to a world, that's also a component of the director's job. But they're trying to tell a character's journey. And I feel that with the idea of the peach seed and that being strung throughout the film from the opening shot to the kind of apocryphal ending of the of the history man. And we're not really sure what happened to Dementis, but this idea of growing out of a tree. I thought there was some really cool elemental imagery and even though Furiosa may not understand it planting the seeds of her actual new home her new green place so even though in Fury Road she's trying to get back to her green place tragically it's not there anymore she does have the a piece of her green place back at home I I really love that component however uh, the, it's ultimately the buck stops with the director to keep the viewer hooked. And every director's job, at least since the, the 70s takeover, this late 60s revolution of Scorsese, Spielberg, Lucas, De Palma, and Coppola, like Hollywood filmmaking, viewers go to movies expecting to be whisked al along a story um, if it is this kind of genre of a film. And George Miller even set that expectation with Mad Max Fury Road. And the only reason you would do a sequel is if you're going to replicate that experience mm -hmm. in some new and surprising way. And so for the first act of this movie, I'm saying the first sequence, the pull of inaccessibility was a fascinating watch, mm -hmm. but it just gets mired in too much of the politics, I think, between sure, characters sure. unrelated to Furiosa's journey. Yeah. And we lose sight of her journey because we get caught up too much in the politics politics between Dementis and Joe. And that does not necessarily inform her story. And while it's interesting to watch, it feels like an episode of a miniseries and not a necessary chapter of this film. So for that, I'm going to give him a four out of five. I think overall he made some amazing choices once again and, and, uh, and told a story for Furiosa that I found to be very, very interesting. It's just... You can't afford to lose an audience in 2024 the way he did. True. Yeah, all right. Let's talk about some of the things that he did right. There were some sweeping camera shots that were so beautiful in this. There were moments where, like, 
you couldn't help but be like, wow, like, oh my God. And I think harnessing those moments were great. I do feel like it was just fueled with testosterone Mm -hmm. because it is the concept of Mad Max, right? Mm -hmm. It's big cars, it's vehicles, it's flame, it's knives, it's violence. Like that's very testosterone heavy. Um, And I think that maybe that's where I had a little bit more of a disconnect. I also do think that George focuses on action over plot and character. Mm -hmm. Like the character Mm. is action and explosions. Mm. And it's like, you know, putting these really drawn out moments where, you know, your war truck is the the main sort of focus and things are happening around it. Now, would he make a fantastic video game? I would love to play that. (laughs) I would love to be driving and have these things coming from the sky, coming from behind, coming from underneath. Mm -hmm. Like the exploration of having just like the truck as like a main centric part, uh, portion here with everything happening around it. Love that. The, the opening was too long. You do, you know, you need to get into Furiosa's story a lot quicker. She she needs to have more of a centric part of this. There was a lot more happening of the outside that you were explaining. Um, needed to zero in a little bit more on that. Um, but as far as sort of like immersion and his directing repertoire like you actually see his mark in this movie and i think he does a good job with that if the script was shorter this would be a better movie Mm -hmm. um if there was more dialogue this would be a better movie if there was uh, more character Mm -hmm. development and those heartfelt moments this movie would be better that does fall on george i'm giving it i can't do 3.75 can i no no (laughs) you can give it a 3.5 it's gonna have to there were some beautiful moments, but it's the 3.5 for me. Okay, okay. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, and, and and honestly, maybe it's not even about, like, more dialogue, but just, like, about different different times to decide when to use dialogue, right? Or it could be the same amount, right? We don't, it doesn't have to be, like, you know, we don't have to inject scenes, like, long scenes of talking, but just, like, how you spend like... your time with, you know, moving that style of the story along. Or I that agree. Part of the story and together. I can't stand telling over showing, but I feel like there was so much emphasis on showing with so much happening mm-hmm. that the beats got lost a little bit. Sure, yeah. sure, yeah. And I do think that there's, like, parts of it where it's, like, you don't... Some of it is, like, better that it's, like not as explained i guess because it's like well we could go into all of this but you just like figure it out yeah yeah Yeah. whereas like when you're saying yeah about getting lost in the politics of it i do feel that a little bit where it's like yeah dementis is like trying to make this whole deal with and morton joe and you're just like what i just don't care (laughs) yeah Yeah. we haven't even seen these other two towns really before you know yeah but hey i really enjoyed it um before we keep going, we want to thank today's sponsor, uh, Mando. Uh, Loom has been popular for a while now, which is why they made Mando Loom for Men. It's the same clinically proven, doctor-developed formula, but in cologne-quality scents for men like bourbon leather, pro sport, and Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji. You've heard Zach speaking the praises of Mando, and when we walked out of Furiosa, we couldn't stop talking about how the wasteland would be a thousand percent better if you had some Mando. Uh, Mando is made with mandelic acid and alpha hydroxy acid that blocks the sweat eating bacteria on your skin from causing odor, so you don't even smell in the first place, and you can put it anywhere. As, an off- as a special offer for listeners, new customers get $5 off a Mando starter pack with code BREAKROOM at shopmando.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit shopmando.com and use code BREAKROOM. And of course, don't forget to go to nerdride.shop where we're always cooking up the latest and greatest in designs for shirts and mugs and more um, in all of our favorite properties. And hey, there's some BREAKROOM merch on there right now. Woohoo! Um, I forgot to say that Zach gave the directing a four. All right. Uh, great in the visuals. Uh, director of photography, Simon Duggan, who shot Great Gatsby and Hacksaw Ridge. Interesting filmography. Uh, <laughs> production designer, Colin Gibson, who worked on Fury Road. And the editing by Margaret Sixel, who is uh, Miller's wife and collaborator on many movies, uh, as well as and Elliot Knapman, who was an assistant editor, editor on Fury Road and 3,000 Years of Longing. So nice to see kind of like a little promotion there as, as, and, and as time goes on. Uh, hey, knockout visuals. I yeah. don't know. Like... This is when, when Zach and I are saying, like, this is a world you want to get lost in, right? Like, it's just so, and it is wild, again, like, to have seen Road Warrior and then immediately be like, oh, my God. And he just, like, has this vision to keep building, building this world. I'm like, when I'm looking at Road Warrior and see the sky can be, like, tinted pink, I'm like, did he always want to do these, like, color saturation and just, like, didn't have, like, the right kinds of technology at the time? Because now this whole, between Fury Road and Furiosa feels so consistent, both just from the colors and the... Uh, the technology and the production design. Um, love to see those little gliders in that big fight scene. Uh-huh. Love to see the kind of like spinning thing. I forget what the exact phrase they use, uh, like the the Bali walker or yes, something. Yeah, yeah. Boomy boom, boom, Waka? Boomy Waka, yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, how'd you all feel? I mean, five out of five visuals. Yeah. It is so beautiful to look at from the color grading to the contrast yeah. to the shot composition. Like every frame is a painting and it's just so stunning to look at. I, I think, and Margaret Sixwell did the editing again and clearly Miller was using the similar technique of just mm -hmm. framing shots directly in the center so that like they could do quick cutting uh, without your eye having to move across the frame. They just, it was a feast for the eyes, this yeah. film. Like you really just felt like Man, it was just like a wonderful, wonderful visual experience. And I, I just think like, this is what George Miller is just changing the game at right yeah. now. It it does remind me of watching things like Lawrence of Arabia, uh, mm -hmm. Cleopatra, um, Spartacus, some of these older epic films that have so many amazing, beautifully composed, establishing shots that have like a, like a hundred extras in it. Mm -hmm. And you feel the scale of it. Um, it's just like our modern sensibilities are attuned to just expect stories to clip along a bit more and just stay mm -hmm. focused, hyper focused on the character, yeah. on the protagonist. And so I think um, that's where I think we get a little lost in the structure of the film. But man, I didn't mind getting lost in it because it was just a wonderful two hours, 20 minutes to just of things to look at. Yeah. Like those maggots in the arms. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yum, yum. How was the how was the audience reaction when you all saw it? Oh, horrible. Yeah, I, I it was. Shut my eyes. It was a lot. I was like, oh, and it went for a while. Yeah, they were like, they no, go. look at it. Look at it. Back. They go back. Yeah, yeah. They do it again. Yeah. And uh, she's like, you'll be safe here. Oh my uh, god. Yeah. That's the thing. I was like, get me out of here. Yeah. Uh, I want a bath. Um, <laughs> I think that you're right. Like the saturations, the colors, it is beautiful. And it's supposed to be big. Big, yeah. And they land that. They mm -hmm. really do. There were a couple of times, though, where the special effects ran in a way where it was like seemingly like fast forwarded or jolting a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I think what he, so I think in Fury Road for sure, he definitely was like, okay, I want to make sure that we like, we're moving at this pace that I want. So I have no qualms about slowing down the, the footage or speeding it up. Right. Or in certain times, like, you know, uh, like in Saving Private Ryan, like cranking the shutter speed. So it feels like more jittery. Right. right. So it's definitely a couple different ways he could have done it, but I feel like that's probably part of it, where he was like, okay, whatever the pace that I want for this movie, we'll, you know. There was do one some time stuff. where it was like that Hermity kind of guy who was delivering a line of dialogue and how he moved was fast forwarded almost. Smeg? <laughs> probably. I think his name was Smeg. God. It was like Smeg, ball bag, toe jam. What else is there? Uh -huh. What was the ball? That was like Scrotus. Sorry. Scrotus. 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 Yeah. And then the Octoboss. Yeah. And uh, Erectus. 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 Yep. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I will give it a four out of five because yeah. I think visually this is spectacular. It is epic. You mm -hmm. harness the epicness. I don't think they went too hard with the CGI. Uh, th that it took away from it. Yeah. I think there was a lot of practicality with this, and that's very hard to do when it's mm -hmm. moving vehicles and mm -hmm. things happening. Um, but I think, yeah, visually, this looks fantastic. It's just those little yeah. fast forward moments that I was like, what was that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I oh my god, we, I forgot to mention this earlier too, but like the way the organic mechanic introduces himself and he's kind of like moving Angus weird. And Samson, he and I <laughs> went to a concert where we saw my uncle play at the Greek theater. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> Holy cow. That's great. And That's so funny. Do you remember how last time I was like we were looking up the characters and I was like, yeah. "Oh, that was my roommate." Yeah. <laughs> she was the wife who gave birth to the deformed baby. Oh, yeah. wow. I could still be a milker. Was that yeah, your know, oh first my name god. Yeah. Still be a good milker. So that's the thing. Like this is very Australian, and I should love it, and I want to love it. <laughs> Tell everyone I loved it. But I'm telling you how I really feel. <laughs> But I'll tell everyone else, fantastic, Australia, let's go. Yeah, yeah. I just love that he's like, well, I'm the organic mechanic. <laughs> and we're all like, oh, yeah, the organic mechanic. So wild to me. Um, but he played it big as well. Yeah. And there's another guy. So this is, I know all these yeah. fun facts. The guy who was kind of always in the background doing like little fun things, uh, who was like following Dementis, mm -hmm. he's a part oh, of a yeah. duo called the Umbilical Brothers who made it really big in like the mid to late 90s mm. where they would do sound effects and act out things, but they'd do like someone behind would do the sound effects of what was happening. Oh. So it was like this full comedic duo and it was actually wonderful to see him in there. Yeah. But at times I thought he overdid it. <laughs> Well, he doesn't have all the sound effects. Is that yeah. Okay, so he's just doing the visuals. It's so the sad. Visuals. He's lost his partner. Yeah. yeah. To the and they life. only hired one of them. I say, like, George. I actually want to find out more about that. I should do some research. Oh, and there's another fun fact in here as well. Do you know the uh, the smaller statured boy mm -hmm. who's with the cabbages? Yeah. Um, 
he was actually in the news a few years ago. Um, I think he'd just started high school. He was about 13 or not even. Um, he's an Indigenous uh, kid who got relentlessly bullied for being sort of a small oh, stature. Well, yeah. And he was like, it, it came news because the mum did a pleading video being like, my son doesn't want to be on the planet anymore. Like the bullying's gotten so bad. So for George Miller to hire him as an actor, put him mm -hmm. on the big screen, gave him so many amazing moments. Yeah. This is like a really good feel good story. Yeah, yeah, where it's yeah. like that's seeing cool. seeing this kid win in mm -hmm. such an epic way, like that's an Aussie tale that I don't think anyone else would really get. But like for me, I saw him and I was yeah. like, yay, he's doing it. Yay, this <laughs> is so great. cool. So there you oh, go. That's great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's cool that, I mean, it's cool that no Have all the Aussie us. fun facts. In yeah. Here. Fun yeah. fact: Anya Taylor Joy, not Australian. No. Dang. <laughs> and yeah, Zach gave the uh, visuals a four point five. He said, yeah. "Look great, especially in IMAX." Yeah. yeah. Mm. Thanks, IMAX. Thanks, and IMAX. I'm giving it a five. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. So, of course, the most important category. And listen, everyone's in the comments saying, Evan, redo the order of the categories. Someone put this together a long time ago. You have the freedom to change it. <laughs> listen, that someone was me. I make the joke <laughs> that this category is at the end. And actually, it is kind of important. You know, sound is more than half the picture. That's yeah. what I've been told. And that's what I believe. Uh, Tom Holkenberg, aka Junkie XL, did the score of Fury Road, Justice League, Deadpool, a long list of credits. Um, I've been humming the score for days. I don't know, what do you all think of the, the score and the sound? The same, no notes for the score. Like yeah. it was the sound mixing, the score. I mean, you, this could almost be three different categories, right? Like the Academy uh, separates yeah. oh, score, exactly. sound mixing and sound editing. Yeah. Um, but you're, I agree with you, Evan. I love the score this movie. A lot of it is just reminiscent of what they did for Mad Max Fury Road. Mm -hmm. uh, but like they do tweak it in little ways to make it Furiosa's theme yeah. leading up into that. The whole movie, um, phonically is like a revving of an engine over two hours and 20 minutes uh, into those final moments where she makes her big choice yeah. to begin Fury Road. So I love it. Five out of five. Yeah. I'm going to give it a four. I really liked it as well. I thought it really kind of like emulated the big wasteland and the grit of it all. I really, I really enjoyed it. The first 15, 20 minutes of the movie sounded like it was completely ADR. I know, I was gonna say, I was like, I, I couldn't really hear in some of the beginning. It was terrible no. for that first I mean, movie. when you rewatch Fury Road, every one of Tom Hardy's lines oh, are ADR. They're all ADR, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. that's just There's something so he does to ADR. tell this story. He's like, yeah. ah, I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. but uh, you it. know, Chris Hemsworth's wife getting a moment of dialogue in there and uh, ADR. Also, ADR, wait, ADR. let's talk about this right now because we didn't talk about it earlier. Nepotism? <laughs> oh. It's not nepotism. She's an actress. They don't want to hang in, out. They just want to hang but out. But she was in the Fast and Furious yeah. movies. She's been in a ton of stuff. No, uh, so Elsa Pataki, Chris Hemsworth's wife, she plays two characters in the movie. We see her first uh, in the green place. She's saying goodbye to Charlie, um, Charlie's the run. She's saying goodbye to Furiosa's uh, mom. Mm -hmm. And then we also see it later as Dementis is traveling the wasteland with uh, Furiosa in tow. We see him capture a group of people, yes. one of which is uh, played by Elsa Pataki as well, kind of like deformed. Formed mouth. Well, she, yeah, uh, well, she gets hit in the she face. Gets hit and right? That's right. Yeah. So then the whole movie, I'm like, is she gonna do something to break Furiosa out? Because I thought it was like the same character. Oh, we don't I know. I did not get that oh. at all. She yeah, I didn't so even. Different. She looks completely okay. different. Okay. I know yeah, that she got, got captured yeah. and had to make her way out, but right. like, you know, her top lip got ripped off yeah. kind of yeah. thing. It looks like she's got like seven marks around there. She just played dirty and mm. like killed someone else even though after Well, she, she goes, grabbed the gun out of his and pointed it at the guy yeah. who had yeah. hit her. And so when he says, lady and gentlemen, lady is yeah. his wife. That's funny. That's pretty That's fun. That's funny. Yeah, and it was, what a, what a interesting uh, kind of thing. But to, to bring it back, sound and score, yeah, I've just been going, dun, 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 dun. I've just been walking around, you know, as we prepare the break room, just singing it. I'm, I'm pretty sure Brandon's like, Evan, stop. I haven't seen the movie <laughs> yet. Uh, but yeah, it's great. I will say, yeah, it was a little bit hard to hear some of the dialogue in the beginning or just like just not quite sure but i do think like you know i've, I've done a lot of stuff where i've done a sh ton of adr and it's just like really funny when you're just like i don't i don't care we're just gonna do it we're just yeah. gonna do it adr uh you know a whole movie called madam web did it and it was yeah 
incredible. <laughs> but you know what? The reason I give this movie a pass when it comes to ADR, it's not just because ADR is used in pretty much every movie, is like both of these movies, Fury Road and Furiosa, are two parts of like a fable. It's another yeah. kind of like, it's a story about stories, about the yeah. power of legend and mythology. Mm -hmm. And so it's really just imagine George Miller as like a puppet master, really just telling, educating the next generation of Wastelanders. Yeah. These are our epic heroes. And really, I'm using them as little puppets. Yeah. And so as a director, he's using just their own voices as ADR and to kind of piece it all together and make it larger than life. Yeah. So I'm okay with it, but I kind understand of it's a little weird. <laughs> all right. So yeah, final score for me so it would be a five. Uh, Zach's final score is a 4.5. Okay. So uh, no fives from Zach? So no fives from Zach. What a I'm coward. I'm surprised. He Fight me, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so as we kind of tally up the final number, um, I, I'll read off Zach's uh, note that I've been deciphering this whole time. He said, looked great, especially in IMAX, and was very well executed. It just didn't hit as hard as Fury Road because it didn't offer enough surprises or advancements from what that film established. A solid good time, just not a mind blower. Okay. Thanks, Zach, for your rousing endorsement of Furiosa. Okay. A man I get it. Up. I, I understand where he's yeah. coming Overall, from. Overall, I feel the same. I think I, I, I feel like as we've kind of discussed, I think maybe I've I liked it a little bit more, or at least I'm very interested in, in seeing it again, especially now that like kind of my expectations or our thoughts around the film have been tampered a little bit, uh, or tempered a little bit, rather. Um, because I do think, uh, yeah, man, we gotta stop watching all these trailers. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Warner does like uh, miscalculate how to promote him. But you yeah. know whose opinion we haven't asked is the Dementus Peach Tree. How he's <laughs> about the movie. Were you properly represented, Dementus, in this story? I'll tell you one thing. <laughs> Oh, this wasn't really how I died. I actually turned into a eucalyptus tree. So that's what I was. I didn't bear fruit. I was just a eucalyptus. So for that reason, I give the movie a four out of five. I don't know if we can be friends anymore. I, I think that's unfair to say to a plant. You, this is the giving tree. And you never know what he's oh, going to give you in the future. Something. Meanwhile, Maude and I are still best friends. I'm still better acting than some of the movie, though. Before we reveal the final score, let's go around and reveal our scores the, that we thought we would give it before the movie, uh, before the video started. I gave it an 82. Oh, I said it would be a 78. I said 77 because I knew what I would say. Wait. Who writes in that pen when you're showing it to a camera? There you go, now you can see it. Um, and the final score is an 83.5. Wow, Evan, well done. Let's go. Can I read a room or what? Uh, 83.5. So uh, how does that compare to other movies that The Break Room has reviewed? Oh, yeah. What do you, uh, Let's see. Well, it definitely was better than Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, a movie that Maude famously loved. If I were in that discussion, it would be a lot lower. I just, I'm really struggling with the last couple of movies about let me connect with the character whose story you're sharing and telling. And I just feel like there's just been a little bit of a disconnect with some of the characters. Yeah. Um, is all. It was a, a half a point under Indiana Jones' Dial of Destiny. Under? A half a point under. Where did it go? Wow. 80, uh, 84. Wow, people were generous uh, to Dial of Destiny. And it was under Transformers Rise of the Beasts. What? <laughs> Which got an 86 from us. I, all right, we need to see the makeup of those panels. Plus, I'm a necessary part of these discussions, it sounds like. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes, I think there might have been something Dune? in the water for those Dune reviews. is our third highest rate, 97.5. What beat Dune? Across the Spider-Verse and Godzilla minus one. Really? Okay, that's, that's fair. But only by 0. 0.5. But that's fair. I still 5. think Dune 2 is better than both of those, but I, I understand. Like, I understand. I, I, I was like, five, five, five. And I said 4.5. I think there should be a new rule that we implement that no one is allowed to give a movie straight fives. Because I think of both uh, those movies, people might have given it straight fives. And I think you have to at least, you cannot give a movie 25 out of 25 points. Oh, I don't think no I, movie is perfect. I, I, well, actually, I'm, I'm quoted to say that Dune 2 is a perfect movie. 
I got quoted. Yeah, yeah, quoted. Yeah, I literally. Got so I, I guess that would mean no movie can have a max score of a hundred. So that's not really fair. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I guess like you can't. I feel uh, like I, I got point five from script only because I didn't like that was for my friends. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. Too, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Like that's one line of dialogue out of everything that was said in that movie. But does it? Yeah, if it takes you out of it enough. Um, hey, that, this has been our review for Doom Part 2. Um, that's <laughs> it for us today. Make sure to subscribe to The Breakroom Channel on YouTube. Furiosa. And I know. Oh, it was a joke! <laughs> it was a joke! I'm funny now. I know I wasn't that's funny at the fun. beginning, but I'm I'll funny give that now. A, I'll give that a fuck. Uh, and give us a follow on Twitch where we do these videos live. Uh, Mob where can the people find you? Right here. <laughs> I really do put my really good faces. In the little hole under the floor. Oh, under the floorboards. Floorboards, floorboards. Where she treats people with maggots and then brings them back to health. Yeah, it's really good here. You should come in here. You'll be safe. I'm actually gutted I wasn't huh? asked to be in this film, but I think that they knew that I would absolutely shit on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at Breakerman on Instagram, Twitter, and Threads, and we'll catch you all later. See ya. Bye, everybody. Please be gentle in the comments.